Hi everyone, I'm Sostine. I want to do something slightly different today and discuss race and integration in a new show that I think everybody should be watching, which is Shadow and Bone. So for all of you who don't know, there's a new television show that came out very recently on Netflix based on the best-selling series by Lee Bardugo called Shadow and Bone. It's honestly the best new show I've seen in years. And when it comes to racial integration, it's the show that I've always wanted since I was a little kid. And today we'll be discussing why. Just a heads up before we get started, we will be discussing race and racism today. So that may be a trigger for some of you out there. Also, the things we discuss may contain spoilers. So for those of you who haven't seen the show yet, I highly recommend pausing this video, going to watch the entire show, and then coming back. To help me discuss this, so it's not just me talking at you for 30 minutes, I'm inviting some guests. So today I have with me Erica from Erica Alamode on Instagram, Nami from YouTube and Instagram, Nami Sparrow, and Nikki from YouTube and Instagram, Nikki Liam. So let's go right to Zoom. First off, would everyone mind introducing themselves? Hi, I'm Erica. I'm Erica Alamode on Instagram. Um, I love cosplay and costuming, and I grew up on fantasy stories, and I'm just so excited to finally have a fantasy hero that looks like us. I'm just so excited to have Alina. Uh, hi, I'm Nikki from Nikki Liam on Instagram and Liam on uh, YouTube. Uh, and I love historical costuming and um, cosplay, Disney, Marvel, Star Wars, the whole thing. Um, but also Shadow and Bone because we finally have an Asian lead. <laughs> hi, I'm Nami from Nami Sparrow on Instagram and YouTube. Um, I am a cosplayer and a book reader, so I actually um, read these books back when the cast was first announced because the reason I was interested in these series was the diverse casting. So let's get started. So first off, the show does something really interesting. The book Shadow and Bone is basically white or assumed white, and the show is actually quite integrated. Erica, what are your thoughts on this? Honestly, I was really surprised when I heard about the casting. Um, and that's actually what got me to read the books too. Um, I, I've i always loved fantasy. I grew up on stories like Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings and like Narnia, Aragon, all of those. Fantasy could be a refuge from this world that we live in where people who look like us are always treated like aliens. But even in fantasy, I always knew that dragons and magic and elves were acceptable suspensions of belief, but somebody who looks like me, someone who's Asian, was not. We were never welcome in those worlds. And in worlds where anything is possible, we are still not possible. And so watching Shadow and Bone and seeing Jessie Mae Lee lead a fantasy story, just it really, it really rocked me to the core because it was someone who looked like me, someone who, who gets discriminated against like me. What's a shoe girl doing here? And I thought that that was so shocking and incredible and affirming to see that she has experiences like we have for looking the way that she does. I thought she was shoe. Well, I guess she's shoe enough. So like Erica, I also grew up on those same series. And I think one of the biggest indications to me that I, as an Indian woman, didn't belong in fantasy was when I was watching the Lord of the Rings series. And in the movies, there is that section where like the savages from the South come and they have elephants and they're brown. And all I could think was, was, wow, this is supposed to be me. This is my people. I am evil. And, you know, it broke my heart because I always saw that my people were the evil ones in fantasy. And when I say my people, I mean all the people who look like me. So this includes Middle Eastern people as well, because despite the fact that I am Indian and Hindu, I do look like Middle Eastern people and Middle Eastern people look like me. And we share a lot of those same struggles because we look like we don't belong. For me, it was uh, refreshing to see that it wasn't a sidekick character or a background character, but actually like a bad ass kicking a female lead that has a really strong story arc and um, grows stronger without help from a male character or a white cis or whatever. 
I'm just going to take a quick moment to talk about our background so that for all of your viewers who are kind of curious where we're coming from. I am South Korean. I was born in South Korea. I came to the United States when I was three, and I am an American citizen now. I am mixed race. I am Japanese, Chinese, I'm part Pacific Islander, Filipina. I'm a whole bunch of things. I'm like a fruit salad of a person. I'm also part Spanish, Portuguese, Puerto Rican, so many ethnicities. Like I, I, we could play bingo with how many I have. So I am 100% South Indian. My dad came here when he, my dad came to the U.S. when he was like seven and my mom came here when she got married to him and I was born and raised in New Jersey. I'm mixed race as well. I am half Dutch, half Asian, uh, which is a mix of Chinese and uh, Indonesian. I want to just talk a little bit about how it compares to the book. I actually read the book back in 2012 when it came out and I've been following with the book since. Having a story like Shadow and Bone that is a YA book that did that did come out in 2012, the first book, you know, and is on its own filled with, you know, the problematic YA tropes of that Twilight age. But it's a book that started as assumed white. You read Shadow and Bone and you're giving descriptions of the characters like Alina does have dark hair. And that's pretty much it. But when descriptions in YA books are so vague, People assume white because these books are targeted towards Western audiences and to Western audiences, whiteness is the default. And because of that, no matter how much you try to represent these characters as non-white, be it in art and cosplay, people who look different than white are often criticized. So people who tried to cosplay Alina before who were not white would be told that they weren't a good Alina cosplayer because of this. And to have but a writer like Lee Bardugo see the whiteness in her stories and go on to write something like Six of Crows that is visibly, actively diverse. The six main characters in no particular order include two characters of colors, two bisexual characters, one gay character, one character who uses a cane, a character with ADHD, and a dyslexic character. It also includes a fat character and of course your straight white male character. You know, they're all there and they're all visible and it is amazing. And the fact that Lee Bardugo in a way anti-Dumbledored her series. She went up there and she said, you know what? I see a problem in representation. I see that this was assumed white. So you know what? I will make it explicitly not. And she said, you know what? Alina is half shoe. Zoya is half Suli. Mal is half Suli. She goes on and she makes these changes. And then she also, in her future books, writes characters of visible race. Yeah, and I love that Lee Bardugo um, did alter it. And, you know, there were a lot of changes, including the agency of Alina. What did people think? And feel anyone just jump in. I loved the changes from the book. I read the book after I heard about the casting and so I already had this vision in mind of what I thought the characters would look like based on the actors but reading the book you can tell that this is a story that people would default read as white. Um, there was no mention of race or of racism in the story um, and so I liked that they made Alina Asian, they made her Shuhan, not just as a visual aid, she wasn't just Asian to be visible on screen. They actually integrated racism against the Shuhan, the like Grisha verse Asians, a, a relevant sort of subplot for Alina. It's thought by making her eyes not shoe, Miss Seffen. Because like when, when Jenya comes in to beautify Alina before meeting the king and queen, uh, in the book, the maids just criticized her for being like tired looking and kind of plain. Um, but in the show, the maid criticizes her eyes. And like that to me, that really struck me because that is a feature that Asians are always given grief for. Like as kids, uh, our classmates will pull back their eyes and chant the we are Siamese, if you please, at us. And I just, I remember that taunt in I remember it vividly. And it's a reoccurring issue that Alina has to deal with throughout the story. I love that they integrated yeah. her race. 
for, for me personally, you know, in Korea, a lot of women get their eyes surgically altered so that they can have like the double fold, which looks more Caucasian, which I definitely do not have. And, you know, um, I was considered like, I remember people telling me, oh, you're, you know, other Koreans would say, oh, you're pretty, except for your eyes, you know, you, could, you should get the surgery. And I never wanted to change my eyes because I personally really like my eyes. And, um, you know, that moment when she just says, no, don't change my eyes. And she's just kind of begging, like that moment, just like, oh God, put an arrow through my heart. It's fine on me. Don't change my eyes. Love how like, she's also fetishized for her Asian-ness. Mm -hmm. That struck me a lot because that's an experience that I've had um, so much. There's a certain um, palatability, I think, in being mixed because like I've been told, oh, you're part white, that's why you're so pretty, um, as a means to demonstrate how my part whiteness makes me more desirable, more acceptable to white audiences um, and for white consumption. So far from show her, aren't you? Why don't you come inside? I was like, that hit me so hard because I've been there before. That is an experience that a lot of Asian women have had. We've all been afraid to walk past a group of men shouting Asian slurs and me love you long time as they follow us down the streets. We've all been cornered by men who assume that because we are Asian, we are designed for their pleasure and that they are entitled to our bodies. And so when, when I saw that experience validated through Alina's story in a fantasy world that didn't need to include it, that meant a lot to me to recognize that that experience happens and that that's a problem. I felt like, you know, to compare this directly to Bridgerton, it really it made the story real. Cause I mean, I think when it comes to fantasy you have one of two options. You can just go full fantasy, have everyone be mixed color and never mention it. And that's really fun too. Cause it's fantasy, like it's make believe. But in the case of this case, you could also go the other way and show how racism plays a part in the story and how it defaults, uh, makes the character's experiences more nuanced. When you're different, when you look different, everything's at risk of becoming a fight. And, that's what I really loved. Yeah, um, also comparing it to Bridgerton, uh, where it's throughout the whole series, it's only mentioned once and more in a way as it was like an afterthought. We were two separate societies divided by color until a king fell in love with one of us. Like, oh, we need to mention why we are mixed race in, in this, this world of Bridgerton. While in um, Shadow and Bone, it's it's part of the storyline and it pops up multiple times throughout the show and addressed and in, integrated into the whole storyline. A fantasy series acknowledges racism and actively shows how it's impacting our main character is so, so big and important. The fact that our main characters, Alina and Mal, have a closer bond because of the racism that they experience as children makes us root for them more. Speaking of things that they got right versus Bridgerton, what else did you think that uh, they did right? But the fact that more than half of your visible main characters are visibly POC was amazing. So like, I can literally count them and it's not just one. We have Alina, we have Zoya, we have Mal, we have Jesper, we have um, Nadia, we have Inej. How could I forget my girl? We have so many main characters who are visibly not white. And then we also have additional characters that are added like the Kirch ambassador and the conductor who are not explicitly mentioned in the books ever and the conductor is entirely created for the show but these characters are also not white and you know you have all these characters who have speaking roles who are not background decoration who are visibly poc it's it's like the opposite of tokenism right exactly <laughs> A lot of the hero characters were people of color in the series, and I think that was really important to a lot of us because typically when we are included in fantasy series, as Nami said before with Lord of the Rings, we're usually the villain. 
we are always that character, but in this series, the people of color were primarily heroes and a lot of the, the villains of the story were white. I think the most compelling part is that not only were most of the heroes people of color, I think there was only one character who could have been considered bad who was a person of color. Um, this was the conductor, but then, you know, all the Fjordans, they're white. Um, the Darkling, when he, when you eventually realize that he is absolutely crazy and evil, he's also white. I'm going to do a really upsetting thing. I'm going to bring up like the Avatar The Last Airbender live action movie because it did integration in the worst possible way. First, it took a show that was all Asian and cast white people in it. Did you see that light shoot? Two, it took the bad people in that story and made them Indian. As you know, the Fire Lord has banished his son, the prince. So visibly brown and the darkest skin in the show. And three, it took the good people, AKA Katara and, and Sokka who are helping Aang and they made them white when they are native. This is a mistake in our industry. I just want to say I am so annoyed at you for bringing up Avatar The Last Bender because now I have to go through that show and get clips. <laughs> I'm so sorry, but also it's on Netflix. Enjoy your rewatch. You just did this to me. Yeah, so um, anyways, but thank you for that excellent point, Nami. <laughs> But now, now, like, let's talk about other, like, um, integration done bad. Like, I think we brought, uh, Nikki brought this up a little bit. The colorism in Bridgerton, which was horrific. Like, the, the you know, the darker the skin, the worse the storyline, the worse the outcome, the more evil the person, right? I may remind you of your place, which is out of my sight and with your bitch mouth shut. Right? Yeah. And I love that it was, I wouldn't even say it was reverse colorism. It was just, like, a jumble and, like, just like real life is great. At f like Zoya, spoilers coming up here, guys. I love how she starts out adversarial in the series. And she is, she is on the darker end of the characters in the show. <laughs> when it comes down to it, when that like moral crux happens right at the climax, she chooses to do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. Help me stop him. And so even having this character of color who's a little bit adversarial at the beginning and kind of has like bad vibes for the hero ends up redeeming herself in a way. And like she and Alina still don't like each other at the end of the story, but they acknowledge each other's validity. And so I think that that was really valuable. I saw that as really beautiful. <laughs> yeah, I love Zoya a lot. You know, the one that I pretty much fixated on in the books because she reminded me a lot of myself when I was young. When she greets Alina and like Alina is like officially accepted as one of the Grisha and she gives her a hug, she says insulting things to her in the book and she like calls her an orphan and like makes fun of her for this. And, you know, normally it was just like the regular bullying, but since Alina is half shoe, Zoya goes on to call her a half breed. You stink of the orphanage, half breed. And the most important and striking part about this is not just, you know, the act of racism that Alina faces, but Zoya herself is a person of color. Zoya herself is half Suli. It addresses the internalized racism that people of color feel in Western spaces towards other people of color who aren't like them. That internalized racism is so harmful and so hurtful. And the fact that you see it, like, so clearly on screen and people look at it and they question they're like hey why is she saying that to her like she's also a person of color but that is what this world does it pits people of color against each other using race as a weapon and it's so sad and it happens so much and it's not addressed in media and the fact that we get it even with that one line it was so effective and heartbreaking so what i found interesting with zella is even though she is a, like um half soothing herself she is uh projecting um, racism herself on other people that are also um, of color or different ethnicity. For instance, when she, uh, during the feat, when she walks up the stairs and people... Uh, um, the ambassadors comment that Inej yeah. is Zemeni. Yeah, and, they, and she sort of like, to herself, corrects them annoyed because, you know, she herself probably has experienced um, racism. I didn't know that Zemeni had such talent. She's Suli. 
And I think she she's projecting her experiences on Alina to make herself feel better, I guess. I think that's a really good point. I totally forgot about the point where she passes that couple and says, she's Suli. And I was like, yes, you know. And, and now, and I kind of wondered how she knew, but you're right. That was a really good moment. I loved that moment because to me, it felt like she was taking ownership of her own Suli identity by claiming Inej as one of the Suli too. She says it with a level of disdain and pride that I found really beautiful because she deserves to own her ethnicity and she deserves to be proud of her fellow Sulis for their excellence. The other thing that I really liked about Ali about Alina's relationship with Zoya and how that showed racial tension and internalized racism is how threatened Zoya was by Alina. And you see it with the Darkling because she wants his attention. He like he used to come to her for things and now he has this new shiny thing that he loves. A lot of internalized racism that we as people of color direct onto other people of color is because we feel like it's a zero some game for that attention, for that inclusion. For he used to call on me on times like this. Other people of color are getting it. It means we're not going to get it because it's how people pit us against each other so that we keep each other down instead of rising up and demanding equity in a way that would benefit all of us. I shall relax when I have Alina. I will say on the matter of colorism though which Christine had had brought up um I I feel that this show did a fantastic job of representing experiences that I've had as a mixed Asian but I also know that some of my darker Asian friends don't necessarily feel the same the one thing that I will say is that I noticed a lot of the people in the show were lighter skinned and I noticed criticism of that from my darker skinned friends who felt like this is an inclusive world where we are still not included um, and I think that 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 lack of representation for the full color spectrum could have impacted some people's vision of this because yet again, another fantasy world trying to include people still leaving out certain people of the spectrum. So I'm also a light skinned Indian woman. I realize that I am comparatively very, very light and I benefit from a lot of privilege because of that. And I like how they cast two um, South Asian women with different looks. So I like how they have, we have Inej who is darker and Zoya who is lighter. But I also acknowledge that we still don't have all of the rep of the darkest. But, but, this is not a criticism on Sujaya or Amita because they are gorgeous and talented and amazing. This is a criticism on the industry for not valuing other actors of darker skin. It is really important to note that Amita has actually talked about her struggles in the entertainment industry and how she has been denied roles for being too dark. So it is not our position as fans to come in here and criticize these actors in turn for being too light. It is our responsibility to love these actors because we love this show and to support them for what they do and support their future casting and projects while also calling out the industry and producers and directors to also give us that dark skin rep that we deserve and um, non-binary people. Like, and by the way, I just want to say, I don't think that I could imagine anyone differently from how they were in the show. I think every exactly. person- in Absolutely. your character to perfection. I, I do want to specify that we wanted to focus our conversation on the representation of Asians in the series because that's that's where we feel we have the most right to analyze critically. Um, we acknowledge that there are conversations on body diversity and colorism for Black characters going on about this show that are extremely valid conversations and need to be addressed in the entertainment industry as a whole. But we also want to put it out there that as th as four skinny Asian girls who are relatively light-skinned, we don't really have the ground to speak on behalf of those conversations. Um, we also want to acknowledge that our criticisms here for colorism um, are not to the actors and actresses playing these characters. Again, reiterating, we think that these people embodied the characters beautifully and we cannot imagine them looking or, or or being portrayed by anyone different because of how well these actors and actresses embody these characters. Um, 
but we do desperately need representation for darker Asians and we want to make sure that we are including that in our conversation because it is a valid conversation of, and it is a valid criticism of the entertainment industry as a whole. It is not a criticism of these actors and actresses and we, do, we absolutely do not condone attacking these actors and actresses for their roles because so many people are trying to police their identity, say you're not enough of this, you're not enough of that they've been told that you're too colored before you're too big before we're not here to tell them now you're not enough to be included because people exist on a spectrum and we want to see the full spectrum we just also want to include that we know these other conversations are happening we just don't feel comfortable addressing them ourselves because we don't have the right to speak on behalf of these other people who deserve to speak for themselves I do want to add that like the changes that they made to Alina's character in particular was something that really spoke to me because first off they made Alina not just a female character who is a protagonist which it, if just by being a female Asian protagonist would have been like enough for me and for the rest of time probably but by making her strong and totally fierce not to mention she goes out and she kisses her guy like Like she wants him so she goes and gets him like I was just like this is the role model that young Steen so needed. They basically took everything that was like sad or bad about book Alina and they changed it and they gave her more energy and you know like they gave her the power to make her own decisions because a lot of the book criticisms I've seen and that I had myself was that Alina didn't do things, T things happened to her in the book. And she just sort of went with the waves and then she would make like one decision per book and then it would be like, bam, done. But this Alina, she makes her decisions. She does things. She burns those maps so she can go on the fold with Mal. And Is it a terrible decision? Oh, absolutely. But she does it, you know? And I think that's so, so, so important. I loved how much agency they gave Alina. I was a little hesitant to be like super excited about the Asian casting at first because when I read the book, I was like, she doesn't have any agency in the show. She is the one who makes these intentional choices. She burns the map to get herself on the skiff. She chooses to kiss Alexander and he's startled by it. Many people surprise me, Miss Dover. I can appreciate Alina's agency in initiating that, and she is the one who chooses, yes, this is what I want. I want this man. And she chooses, in the end, to go after the stag. Mal is the one who chooses that in the book. She is the one who says, we're going after the stag. We're going to get it first. It is the only way to save people. She has so much more power, and that, to me, is way more exciting than yet another passive Asian female character. Also, just a little side, side note, not only did they cast an uh, Asian female lead. She also, they also casted an Asian female lead that's neurodivergent. Um, really? Which I think, besides the whole representation, I thought that was like extra, like an extra cherry on, on the top. <laughs> yes, we can. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's the epitome. Like, um, one thing I hated about, like, um, in the book is when, he, when Alexander are Darkwing, and I don't ship book Alexander and Alina because that is an abusive relationship. Um, <laughs> When he asked her, like, can I come to you tonight? She goes, there's like, she doesn't answer. Like yeah. there is no answer. And I'm like, girl, if you want it, just say yes. Yeah, oh my God. <laughs> it's like so, so bad in the book. And I think one thing that's very important to note real quick is that Lee Bardugo wrote this very much to be an abusive relationship in the books and to be like, this is bad, Darkling's bad. Do not ship this. And don't get me wrong, I will forever love Ben and think he's hot, but I'm very excited to see how he portrays that, that aspect of this relationship because I think he did an amazing job in the collaring scene. We can do anything together. By, you know, just showing how incredibly horrifying what he was doing to her was. And like, just... I can't wait for the evolution and to see, you know, what this new Alina, who is, who has this agency is going to do. Netflix, please give us season two. Also guys, I just want to add, consent is sexy. <laughs> when, when Alexander asks, are you sure? And she says, yes. 
Oh my god, we all freaked out. Are you sure? We've had so many moments on that. Consent is sexy, and so is a woman of color owning her sexuality, owning her choices, owning her life. I can use it now. So guys, um, thanks so much for talking to me about all of this. I would like to have uh, some fun questions too. So first off, the most important question of all, are you team Darkling or team Mal? Can I say I'm team Ivan and Fedor feeding each other at the Fed? Like that is my team. each other I was like excuse me excuse me who did this I the the trope of like tall angry and small sweet is just so good I can't pick a team you can't ask me to pick between the good boy the good color boy who I love Mal who is just so he's a protector he's dedicated he's loyal all he wants to do is keep her safe loved that he respected her that much and so it's just like oh gosh now I love you even more but also <laughs> this this show brought back my childhood love of Ben Barnes in such a big way Okay, so I am 100% Team Mal. I was Team Mal in the books too. I was kind of meh about book Mal, but I liked Melina because Alina chose Mal. And I was like, you know what? It's one of like three decisions this girl ever made. I stand by <laughs> her for it. Melina always let these two kids just be happy together. I, I, I also support Team Mal. Um, I really love the magnetic relationship they have even before they realize themselves you guys are killing me am i the only team darkling in this <laughs> okay so here's the thing i fully support alina's choice to choose mal i just also i see i see the darkling and i'm like you know what would i commit would i would i commit tyranny for this man maybe who knows <laughs> i am i am cosplaying my husband as the darkling guys like i I am team Darkling. Oh, just for the record, in the books, I was team single. I actually hated both Mal and the Darkling. Team neither. Team single. Dude, you have a career as, a, as like the Sun Summoner. Like you don't need a man. If you were in the Grisha universe, what power would you have? Taylor. Sun Summoner. Fabricator, a durest. Healer. So what is your favorite part of the show? The train scene with Milo. Oh, so soft. The goat. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't know what the goat was for until it was needed <laughs> for Jasper and I just if I find one Jasper cosplayer carrying a goat I can die happy <laughs> I I also love that scene but for a very like specific reason that might not be clear if you weren't looking for it so I loved that scene because Jesper has ADHD and like he's literally using that goat as a way to like, you know, regulate his emotions and like, you know, instead of focusing on their situation, he's hyper focusing on how the goat feels in his arms, you know, and I just, I really loved that like super subtle way of like showing his ADHD versus, you know, Mal giving, or sorry, versus Kaz giving him a mission and he'd be like, I'm gonna do something else. <laughs> so what was your favorite part, Nami? Is the goat. Let's promise never to forget each other, my love. <laughs> it was the goat, and <laughs> it was it was specifically the follow up to the goat where Jasper just like does his thing where he shoots all of Volcra, and you're just like, what? While holding Milo was just such a good combination of like coping mechanisms for mental health issues, but still being awesome. And I was like, yeah favorite moment of the show I love I love the winter fit episode because I love that Alina takes charge in that she takes ownership of her power she dazzles everyone and she just gives Alexander this look like I know you're impressed when she does it <laughs> Um, and then she makes it even better and she just explodes the light all around them. And it's so fantastic. I loved how much agency she had. I loved how much power she had. And also I loved her kefta. I want that kefta. I need We're it. We're making that kefta. 
oh yeah, we're definitely making that kefta. Friends, we are definitely making that kefta. Please come back in about two months. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, you know, I, I can talk about I can talk about this show forever with you guys because it's so much fun. But anything you want to say before we tune out? Uh, Keep an eye out for all of us to inevitably make Grishaverse cosplays because uh, (laughs) we're obsessed and it's happening. (laughs) Sponsored by Christine, buying us a whole bunch of wool in bulk to save on shipping costs. Thank you, girl. You're making my Zoya dreams come true. Yeah, stay tuned for all of the Grishaverse costumes coming because Lord knows there's a lot of them in this group. Uh, I just want to say, if any of the actors or people who worked on the show see this, like, please know this is like a love letter to you guys. Thank you for making us something so precious.